Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome to our daily Dhamma. When we try to de define or explain Buddhism, uh, there are lots of different ways we can try to sum up Buddhism. We could say that Buddhism is all about suffering. That's a common one, right? We hear about the Four Noble Truths. We think, you want, you want the defining feature of Buddhism, it's suffering. Or maybe we th think of the goal of Buddhism. And we say Buddhism is all about freedom liberation, or more specifically, nirvana. What is Buddhism about? It's about escaping samsara. Or we might look at the quality of Buddhism and see how Buddhism is different from faith-based religions and say Buddhism is all about wisdom, or understanding, or insight. You might even say Buddhism is all about moderation or the middle way. Right? People who think of the first teaching of the Buddha where he taught what he called the middle way and they think, well, that's the, the essence of Buddhism. There are different ways to explain it. We might say, Think about the, the Satipatthana Sutta and think of mindfulness. Say Buddhism is all about mindfulness. As the Buddha called mindfulness the, the Ekayana Manga. And he devoted a lot of his attention to, a lot of his time to, practice, to teaching the four Satipatthana. The four foundations of mindfulness. But there's one, one concept, one idea that I think perhaps best sums up the Buddha's teaching or is most true to the, the Buddha's intention for what his, his legacy was to be. If you're going to, you know, in fact, it's, it can be detrimental to, to try and explain Buddhism as being one thing, right? Or as being one simple concept. So as a gross oversimplification, if we're going to grossly oversimplify the Buddha's teaching, we should sum it up by, really we should sum it up by the concept of apamada. Simply because this is this is how the Buddha would have it, it seems would have it summed up, and how those who carried on the Buddha's teaching and compiled the Tipitaka, how they would have it summed up. How we know about the Buddha is because his last words were "Apamadena sampadeta." everything everything that arises ceases all formations are subject to cessation it means anything that we build up will fall down anything we cling to will 
will eventually fade away. We'll lose everything we hold dear. And so we should apamadina sampadita be, become full or bring to f fulfillment or be ever engaged in apamada. And we have in the Dhammapada we have verses like Appamado amatta padang pamado machuno padang ye pamata appamato nami appamata nami anti ye pamata yathamata Someone who is pamada uh, Someone who is appamada Appamada is the path to path to immortality. Pamada, which is the opposite, is the path of death. Those who are Appamada never die. Those who are Pamada are as though already dead. Or we have, in regards to Angulimala, yo pume pamajitwa ya pachano pachaso na pamajiti so manglo kang pabhasi ti chando mutova abho mutova chandima. Sorry, mangled that one. Uh, who in the past was pamada, but in the present becomes apamada. They illuminate. Like Angulimala. Angulimala used to be Pamada, and now he's. Once he met the Buddha, he became Appamada. They light up the earth, they light up the world, like the moon coming out from behind a cloud. It's our mind or our being is, is capable of so much brightness, so much greatness. But when we're Pamada, shrouded, it's covered, it's obscured. So how do we understand Pamada? It's an interesting question. I, I like to ask this of my Sri Lankan students because they tell me, well, Appamada means to not be late. It's this curious thing how it's changed in, Sri, in Sinhalese. But I think it comes from the idea that you lose track of time if you're Pamada. You lose track of yourself, right? This sounds quite Buddhist, doesn't it? When you're not aware. Oh, it's time to go, it's time to do this, it's time to do that. You're not present. So you lose track of time and as a result you're late. Something like that. But no, the best way, the easiest way to understand Pamada and Appamada Pamada being the bad one, Appamada being the good one. As when we look at how the Buddha discussed um, intoxicants, alcohol. The fifth precept, Sura Merya Manja Pamada Tana. Alcohol, liquor and booze, liquor and beer. Is, uh, is a pamadatana, is a basis for pamada. So the ordinary way of understanding pamada is that it, it's intoxicating, in, intoxication, when we're drunk. That's what it means to be pamada. It comes from the root maj, like yo pube pamajitwa pachano so na pamajati. Maj. Maj means to be drunk, or means to be <coughs> confused or deluded, clouded in the mind, unclear.
spot just turns it into something a little more special, a little more um, extreme. So pamanj is something like when you're when you're actually mentally incapacitated, and maj is just the idea of being confused, I think. But pamanj or pamada, when it becomes. This is when you're truly intoxicated, so either physically from taking alcohol or intoxicants, or mentally from engaging in or being overwhelmed by desire, aversion, delusion, which cloud the mind, confuse the mind, destroy the clarity of the mind and the purity of the mind. Of course, apamada has everything to do with, with sati, with mindfulness. And the Buddha said, satiya vipavasu apamato ti ujjati. To never be without sati, this is what it means to be apamada. So we understand pretty clearly, I mean, it's not like this is a hard to understand or a poorly understood concept for those who have studied it. It's not like the texts are, are unclear. But it's important that we understand exactly what... what this is an important concept to understand. Clarity of mind is what we're talking So apamada means not, ha not being clouded, not being confused, not being intoxicated, really. The idea is that the defilements of the mind intoxicate us. They take away our clarity. They keep us from seeing clearly. So our practice in meditation, really, this is what it's all about. We can talk about mindfulness, this is a good thing to talk about. We can talk about wisdom or insight. These are good aspects of it, but the real active component is cultivating clarity of mind. We use mindfulness to do that, when you remind yourself, seeing, seeing, pain, pain thinking, thinking, or whatever. You're actively cultivating clarity of mind. You're trying to remind yourself, hey, this is what's happening. This is, what, this is what's present. This is reality. Bringing your mind back, dragging your mind out of the clouds, back down to the mundane, objective reality of our experience what we're seeing, what we're hearing in every moment, see, smelling, tasting, feeling, thinking, the body, the mind. So there's this idea that we're, we're intoxicated. We're intoxicated due to ignorance. We're intoxicated due to our attachments and our aversion. We're like drunk people. They're really most of the time drunk on Drunk on life, drunk on youth, drunk on sensual enjoyment. We don't see clearly. We have very strong delusions, and our habits are based on delusion. And so our reactions to our experiences are based on delusion. Why we like certain things, why we dislike certain things, why we react violently, either positive or negative, to our experiences. It's because, of, because we are intoxicated, we're drunk. And so our meditation practice is about sobering up. It's about having this pure state of mind, this clear state of mind. That's the active component, that's what changes us. That's what lifts us out of the quagmire. Lifts us out of the morass of the delusion that we're caught in. So if you want to 
I mean, the use of this is to help us understand or help us get a sense of how meditation should be experienced. What should it feel like to meditate? How do you know if you're truly meditating? And it's the difference between following your delusions and seeing them clearly. Once you start to see your, your desires, your aversion, your confusion, your delusion, your doubt, your worry, your stress, once you start to see it clearly, and you start to be present, it's like waking up. You feel like you lived your life asleep, and you're only just waking up. It's like you lived your life drunk, and you've only just sobered up. And that's really, I mean, again, there are many ways and many important aspects of the Buddha's teaching, but the last words of the Buddha, what the commentary says is the whole of the Tipitaka, all these thousands of teachings of the Buddha, when you sum it up, it's the path or the, the way and the means to become apamada, to become sober, unintoxicated. And so along with all the other aspects of the teaching, this is what um, this is what we what we see as the essence of Buddhism, because it leads to all of the good things. And it's the use of mindfulness to create clarity of mind, which brings about morality, concentration, and wisdom, and understanding, and freedom, and release liberation from suffering. So to be clear, this is what our meditation should bring. It shouldn't just make you calm or make you feel good or reinforce your beliefs or your ideas. Meditation should help you, should make this shift where you start to see things clearly. You start to understand yourself and, and see what you've overlooked start to see what's in front of you and see the nature of your own mind and the nature of the world around you of this impermanent suffering and non-self and you begin to let go you begin to give up all these bad habits that are like it's like darkness and in darkness grow many unpleasant things mushrooms, bacteria mold, but when you shine the light on, when, when the sun shines down, it all dries up and cleans up and becomes purified, and purified by the light. All these bad habits, all these unwholesome qualities of mind are dried up through the power of mindfulness, through the power of clarity. So something for us all to remember, to think about, and to keep in mind when we practice that our goal is clarity of mind. So there you go. That's the Dhamma for tonight. Thank you all for tuning in. I wish you all the best.